Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. I wish to commence today's program by hoping that you've had a wonderful holiday season over the last two or three weeks. And I want to pause for a moment on our program to say that today we reach another milestone in the history of the North Idaho College Public Forum. We are in our 31st year and with today's program we are airing our 1,500th program, a weekly program. And I was trying to decide what do I want to do to recognize this milestone and I wanted my colleagues here that have been so supportive for so many years. Uh, two of the three, uh, unfortunately I haven't known Anne in a long time but we're delighted to have her here. But two of uh, our guests today have been with me and been very supportive over that length of time. And our panelist, Janelle Burke, who's been here uh, about 29 of those uh, 31 years. And so let us, through books, in our discussion those days, celebrate the 1500th program. And with that, I welcome, first of all, to the program, Ann Porter, who is a member of our faculty as an art instructor. And uh, Ann, welcome back from last week. We really enjoyed the program on fiction, it'll be non-fiction uh, books this week. I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm so pleased to have back my very good friend, Dr. Virginia Tinsley Johnson, uh, who is the chair of the North Idaho College Communication and Fine Arts, and I can really testify to her as a longtime colleague. She's the only person North Idaho College been here longer than I, and so I feel very <laughs> close to her. Uh, been here just a very, uh, uh, almost the same amount of time, and uh, Virginia, you're a wonderful friend, and Thank you for helping us celebrate our 1500th oh, this program. This is exciting. I'm really pleased to be here. Thanks, Tony. And our also a very good friend, Denise Clark, who has worked with us in the Popcorn Forum for years and is just such a wealth of information. Help us put that all together and, and all the support you've given to the, the TV program over the years. Thanks for having me here, Tony. And a very, very big thank you to Janelle Burke, who's been so steady and, and continued over all these years with us. And Janelle, it's so important that you be here for the 1500th program. Thank you, Tony. And our subject I said today is a review of best-selling books of nonfiction. And Janelle, you can commence today's questioning. Last week, the first question was a question about what is your favorite, and I'd like to do that again. We'll just hop right in to saying not saving the best for last, but starting right out with the best. And so uh, let's start again this week with uh, you, Jenny. Okay. Um, can you tell us uh, what your favorite nonfiction this year is? Oh dear. Well. It you can is have like trying to three choose favorites, your favorite you child, like. but um, I'm going to choose one woman and one man, and these are my favorites, not just for this season, but I haven't read the latest book by Anne Lamott, but I'll tell you, this is one of my favorite books of all times. This is Bird by Bird, and it is a book about writing, and since I've been teaching writing and I aspire to write sometimes, you can probably tell I have a few favorite passages in this book. It's a bristle with sticky notes. But Anne Lamott has also written a book um, called Operating Instructions, which was about her first, well, her only child that she had, which is hilarious. And then uh, her latest book is fiction, but the one before that, Traveling Mercies, was one of my all-time favorites about her own spiritual crisis and kind of coming to grips with her relationship with God and not at all heavy-handed or... Uh, so she's very uh, self-deprecating uh, and doesn't take herself very seriously. And then my, I guess I'd say my favorite male author uh, of nonfiction, or one of them, sorry everybody else, is Richard Seltzer, who is uh, now a retired surgeon. And this is a collection of his, I think is pretty new, The Exact Location of the Soul. And he writes absolutely spectacularly, and he writes about uh, medicine and spirituality and people's health and just his own role as a surgeon. So I would pick those two, Richard Seltzer and Anne Lamott, as wonderful nonfiction writers. I know we're going to want to come back to some of those books, mm -hmm. but uh, let's go on right for right now with you, Anne. And do you have a favorite this year? I think I do. Um, it's pretty easy for me to say that Bandit. Um, was my favorite work of, of nonfiction. Uh, Bandit, I see a, a picture of a pretty ferocious looking dog there. Uh, is that Bandit? The, this is Bandit. And um, this is written by Vicki Hearn, who was 
an incredibly interesting woman. She was a uh, an animal trainer and a lecturer in literature at Yale. <laughs> and it is the story of Bandit. And this Bandit is, is, is what kind of a dog? Uh, Bandit is a pit bull. Well, she goes into uh, the definitions of what a pit bull is. And he's not really a pit bull, he's a bull terrier. But the general usage is, yes, Bandit's a pit bull, and he was declared a dangerous dog and was supposed to be put down. And she instead adopted this dog and used this history as kind of a meditation on what we think about animals, what we think specifically about the relationship between humans and dogs, and what that says about them and what that says about us. For all the pet lovers out there and the people who are interested in animals in general. Uh, what about you, Denise? Well, speaking of animals, <laughs> <laughs> I will share one of my fun books. I, I'm not sure that it's one of my favorites, but I certainly enjoyed it. It's called The Nine Emotional Lives of Cats um, by Jeffrey Musaf Masson, <laughs> uh, who has lately written uh, several books on animal uh, consciousness, uh, animal intelligence, uh, the emotional lives of animals. and. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Masson lives with a tribe of cats, and notice he says lives with because one <laughs> never owns a cat. Uh, <laughs> as a person who lives with cats, <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a wonderful narrative about his relationship with his cats and how he has observed um, them interacting with other humans and with one another. And of course, um, uh, Jeffrey Masson is convinced that animals uh, do think, that they are conscious, that they do have emotional, they do possess emotional responses. We may not understand them because they will be entirely different than our emotional responses to situations. But he is convinced that, of course, they possess a very rich emotional life. And having lived with cats for many years, I concur. So <laughs> this has been one of my favorites this year. And do you have another favorite? Another favorite is a collection of essays I picked up by Jonathan Franzen called How to Be Alone. I love essays. That's one of my favorite forms of, you know, a nonfiction writing. Uh, and I, I love Franzen's The Corrections. The Correction. Um, it's um, after reading that novel, The Corrections, and then picking up his, I was really excited, you know, that he had some other work coming out. And these were essays that he has published. Um, on various topics uh, that range all the way from um, why the Chicago mail system does not work <laughs> to uh, what it means to be a reader in the 21st century. Um, so That is really favorite. interesting. Uh, on the last show, I know when we went off the air, Denise was uh, somewhat uh, mm -hmm. deeply concerned that we were not able to list all the books that we had with us. And so I'm going to do that this round because thinking of our viewers, uh, not only your favorites, but other books that you have brought. We'll just uh, briefly go through those because our viewers have different reading interests and that for you're introducing more books to them. And Virginia, I'll start with you again, please. I've already done Lamott and Seltzer. Sure. Um, a couple of my favorite genre are, well, essays, as Denise has, and particularly travel writing because I love to travel. And I think one of the best travel writers, the funniest, is a man named Tim Cahill. And who has written several that all have zany titles. This one is A Wolverine is Eating My Leg. And he has others uh, like uh, Jaguars Rip My Flesh and so forth. And he is well-traveled around the world and he just writes hilariously about it and makes you want to go too. Um, along those same lines I have, this is the best American travel writing of, I think this is 2000. Uh, it was edited by Paul Theroux, who is another one of my favorite travel writers. And this one has is just a selection of fantastic essays about travel. One of them I even have Mark in here with a piece of Kleenex because I couldn't finish reading it. It was too hard on me. And I can read almost anything, but this is about uh, some girls who were kidnapped in the Sudan. And it's called This We Came to Know Afterward. And I may never know because it was too powerful. Um, I also brought along another of my favorite nonfiction writers, that's Terry Tempest Williams, whose book 
Refuge, I think, is a must read for just about anybody in the world. It's she is a fantastic writer. She's a lovely person. She's been at Auntie's a couple of times, and she has a book called Leap, and one called Red. I think it's Leap. Is it Denise? That's about her study of the Bosch triptych, uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights, where she went yes. to the Prado and studied that for a really long time. But this one's about her mother as a refuge, dying of cancer, and the Great Salt Lake uh, in a flood. And then I think I had, well, I guess that's, oh, sorry, no, nope, I have two more. Uh, well, this is Paul Theroux, The Great Railway Bazaar, and this is the first one I ever read by him, and it's uh, traveling across the, on the Great, uh, Ala or not, sorry, it's the Great Siberian Railroad, plus follow, going south, um, even through uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And then last but not least, and this is the most recent of the, nonfiction I've read is a book by one of my true favorites and that's Oliver Sacks. This is called Uncle Tungsten. It's his autobiography and this is, I think its subtitle is Memories of a Chemical Boyhood and about an uncle of his who was a chemist who indulged his almost every whim in some wild experiments but how he became interested in being a scientist. So I really recommend Oliver Sacks. Thank you. That's very helpful. Anne? Well, I'm jealous that Virginia brought Oliver Sacks, and I <laughs> forgot him because he really is just a wonderful writer. Well, I did bring Bandit, as I said. I also brought The Botany of Desire, which I think is a really interesting book about our relationship with plants. Um, and it takes you on some very unexpected twists and turns. I think this is, um, and it's divided into four sections, so you can kind of pick and choose a and little bit. And the author is Michael Pollan. And then lastly, I brought another one of my favorite authors, um, and that is Stephen Jay Gould. And the book I brought was Bully for Brontosaurus. Um, uh, but really, you, I think it, you could pick up anything by Stephen Jay Gould, and it would just be great. He's just a fascinating author. Thank you. And Denise. Um, I'm amazed that people brought books by authors I really like. <laughs> you know, and I, I read less nonfiction than I read fiction, so I was running out of the house collecting things, and I said, oh, I only have two here, um, which I did share with, uh, with our audience. But another title I would like to add is one that Virginia and I were just discussing before this program began. It's one by Harry Cruz, and it's called My Childhood. Um, for anyone who would like a peep into a very, I would almost call it a brutal childhood, uh, Harry Cruz, who is a, a well-known author, lives in Florida, has written several novels and collections of essays. Florida Frenzy is one of my favorite collections of his essays. Uh, grew up a, as a sharecropper on a, his, par his mother. Uh, sharecropped, uh, and I believe a Georgia, a mm -hmm. small Georgia, you know, uh, farm, and they were exceedingly poor. Uh, Harry Cruz only got an education because when he left high school, he went into the service, and and in fact, I think he dropped out of school and finished, you know, his schooling, high school, in while he was in the service in the 50s, I believe and then decided he wanted to become a writer. And uh, his, his life uh, growing up as a child and his life now are so disparate that one wonders how he is able to bring those two halves of his life together. And I suspect he has had problems with that uh, as he has fought alcoholism for many years. Uh, and. But I, it was one of the most powerful books I think I've, I've ever read. Um, I remember Virginia, do you re remember the scene where he and his little friend are looking at a Sears and Roebuck catalog, mm -hmm. a little sharecropper boy, um, an African-American boy up the road whose father sharecrops, and they're sitting and they're looking at the Sears catalog and all of these people, and they find it so amazing and so wonderful that all of these people in the catalog possess all of their body parts. Because everyone they know is missing a finger, teeth, maybe an arm or a leg, mostly from agricultural accidents or just ill health or 
a, a lack of, of medical attention because they absolutely couldn't afford medical attention. So <laughs> it's, a it's a powerful book. I'm going to do something I've never done on our show of, of our books, and so I'm going to tell you one too. <laughs> I'm going to participate in the process. A little surprise to you. I read a book this summer that, that's a nonfiction that I think is just uh, very, very visionary and, and futurist. It's by Dr. Richard Florida. He teaches at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the title of the book is The Rise of the Creative Class. And he's done a very in-depth uh, study of our cities in this country and what's going to happen in the 21st century. And then in the book he chooses the cities that he thinks are going to be the great cities of the 21st century and those who are going to be left behind. And he chooses cities such as Boston and Seattle and San Francisco and Austin, Texas and, and Gainesville, Florida are examples. And then he talks about the creative class, which is about 38% of the population that's highly educated and can live wherever they wish. And they're choosing cities based upon a criteria that he has. And it's not always the city they choose where they actually have the highest salary. And he has indexes, and for Virginia in particular, you'd be so interested to know that one of the great, great issues uh, for those individuals is the arts and humanities within that city. And so I would recommend that for those who are maybe deciding where they might be in the future. And he has different indexes about, uh, also about human rights issues and all of that. So anyway, I want to throw that out because I thought it was a very impressive book. And I spoke in Florida, I was on a four-day tour in Gainesville, and I told them they'd been chosen. And, the president of the college said his email just became just overloaded with faculty members saying, where do I get this book <laughs> since they had been chosen. With that, I'll turn to Janelle Burke. One of the interesting areas to read is biographies as well. And uh, I'll just throw this open to anyone. Has anyone read an interesting biography? Uh, I know you did include one of those, mm -hmm. uh, Jenny, in your list. But has anyone read another interesting biography or one perhaps that has been recommended or is recommended, um, Denise, that you've ordered at, at the uh, library? So it's kind of an open question. And while we're waiting, however, um, let's do a piece, I understand, from the scalpel. Uh, the doctor's oh, book, um, okay. uh, and I think you have that. Um, I do actually. I, I can find it's called the knife, but because I did choose a different passage, but I'll see if I can find the knife. Or, or you can you can choose a different passage okay. uh, if you like. Just to explain to us what it is that we're going to be uh, observing. Well, here. this is probably I chose this for shock value, but. I admit that, okay? Uh, because Richard Seltzer is just a stunning writer, and I guess I went into this thinking, you know, a doctor who can write, and I did, and he's telling, this is the chapter entitled, The Exact Location of the Soul, and he is on uh, in the college infirmary, and his last patient comes in, he's a young man who's just come back from Guatemala, and he has a dressing on his upper arm, and there's a, as he says, a clean punched out hole the size of a dime, but the tissues are swollen and tense, and there's a, I'll just read, a thin brownish fluid lips the edge, and now and then a lazy drop of the overflow spills down the arm. An abscess inadequately drained. I will enlarge the opening to allow better egress of the pus. Nurse, will you get me a scalpel and some... What happens next is, is enough to lay Francis Drake a vomit in his cabin. No explorer ever stared in wilder surmise than I into that crater from which there now emerges a narrow gray head whose sole distinguishing feature is a pair of black pincers. The head sits atop a longish, flexible neck, arching now this way, now that, testing the air. Alternately, it folds back upon itself, then advances in new boldness, and all the while, with dreadful rhythmicity, the unspeakable pinchers open and close. Abscess? Pus? Never. Here is the lair of a beast at whose malignant purpose I could but guess. A Mayan devil, I think, who would burst free to fly about the room with horrid blanket wings and iridescent scales, raking, pinching, injecting God knows what acid juice. And even now the irony does not escape me, the irony of my patient as excavator excavated. And so he goes on then as the high priest with his uh, scalpel and he uh, has to try to catch this thing and he gets it with a clamp and pulls it out. And what it is, as he says, it's about the size of an English walnut with these little black hooklets on it. And he puts it in a specimen jar and it frantically waves around and it is the larva of a bot fly that has oh, wow. gotten into this man's arm but just not not writing well I got the larva of a bot fly but he personifies it in fact he calls him imposter sore head servant of Satan and uh, writes about it so excitingly about these things that he does <laughs> yeah. 
Denise. I, don't want to read it now. <laughs> I think that got Denise. <laughs> I think it did too. I thought for a moment we'd gone into nonfiction. I mean, back into fiction. I mean, from nonfiction to fiction. Yeah. Well, does, any, does anyone have? Yeah, uh, I was going to mention a biography. Uh, uh, I guess I'm making a pitch for my old champion, Mary Wollstonecraft, but I have read, there are two new biographies of Mary Wollstonecraft that are out now, and one of them um, I have read partway through, and it's just called Mary Wollstonecraft, but I'm just pleased to say that she's coming into her due. And then I thought of another that's, again, it's probably, it's really autobiography, and uh, there's really two parts in this book, is by Mary Carr, K-A-R-R. -R. One is called The Liar's Club, and the other is called Cherry. And these are remarkably insightful books about her own life growing up in Texas. And then I'm going to have to ask Denise to help me with the other one, uh, the author of a, a Girl Named Zippy. Do you remember who wrote that one? Oh, I wrote that it. down and then I don't have it. But the girl growing up in Montana with a really strange family. <laughs> but she was a little girl who just zoomed around everywhere, so they nicknamed her Zippy when she was young. And, uh, but it's just, it's really fun to read about people who have what you consider sort of ordinary, sort of, you know, growing up in town X, and yet how remarkable those lives can be, even when you're so from remarkable small town. while ordinary. Is while what ordinary, you're yes. Yeah, um, you don't expect the it, things that are. all of us go through and we can identify right. with, mm -hmm. but at the same time they're rather extraordinary yes. when they're put down in, in right. uh, written form. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think one thing that's real powerful. We're running out of time, but. I'll go to Denise first. And can you have a short passage from one of your books that you'd like to read for us? Because I think the illustration of the, of the language and the writing is important. Um, let me see if I can uh, find. This is a short passage from one of the essays in Franzen's collection. And it's an essay that is titled, let me see if I can find the title of the essay. Oh, it's, it's called why bother? And it was first published in, in Harper's Magazine. Uh, and he talks about, essentially it's why bother about, ab about reading? Um, why bother writing? Why bother being a writer? Why bother being a reader? Uh, and I, I just picked this out. He says, what emerges as the belief that unifies us is not that a novel can change anything, but that it can preserve something. The thing being preserved depends on the writer. It may be as private as my interesting childhood. But as the country grows ever more distracted and mesmerized by mass culture, the stake rises even for authors whose primary ambition is to land a teaching job. Whether they think about it or not, novelists are preserving a tradition of precise, expressive language, a habit of looking past services into interiors, maybe an understanding of private experience in public context as distinct but in interpenetrating, maybe mystery, maybe manners. Above all, they are preserving a community of readers and writers, and the way in which members of this community recognize each other is that nothing in the world seems simple to them. That's again powerful. And then we'll turn to you, Anne, that you have one that you might like to read. I have one also on language. Um, this is um, from Bandit, and uh, Vicki Hearn is talking about um, how dogs think, how people think. And, and she's talking about people here. And she says, we have traded awareness for language. It is our fate, then, to have to return to awareness through language, or at least to make the attempt to have to deal with speaking or not speaking, writing or refraining from writing, all our lives long. Whether in our individual selves and moods, we take the destruction of the Tower of Babel to have been complete and permanent or not. Again, all of those are illustrations of real gift at writing. And we'll turn back to Janelle. Each year you have many choices. And so how do you go about selecting the books you're going to read in the nonfiction area? Now, I know, Denise, that you've said you don't read as many. But perhaps, um, how do you categorize nonfiction books? Are they books that are important because of what's happening around us in the world? Or are they books that um, have to do with a specific subject? Or, or how is it that you categorize and decide what books you're going to order, what books you're going to read? Well, often I just look at the author. For example, I have read some Stephen Jay Gould, 
and I know Gould's work, and I know that if I pick one up, I know I'm going to like it. Uh, I tend to have an interest in a lot of different topics, and I think most readers do. And uh, like Jun Virginia, I love the Great Railway Bazaar. When she mentioned that one, I read that when it first came out, and I thought it was just a wonderful book. So I think a lot of our choices are based on uh, works by authors we are with, with whom we are familiar. Um, also, reviews. I read a lot of reviews. Important. And that's and to me that's an an, an important um, you know kind of sorting device that I use. Uh, are the are the reviews uh, you know glowing? And am I intrigued? <laughs> am I intrigued by the review? Does it hook me? And to say, oh yes, yes, mm -hmm. I must read this. How about you? Um, Jenny, uh, I'm. I do what Denise does. Uh, I think it's name recognition. I'm. I'm always saying, "Oh, good, Anne Lamott has a new book out." I'm. I'm really looking forward to that because my experience has been really good with her. But I sometimes take books that I, I listen to on public radio. I listen a lot to public radio, and it's sort of hard to write down titles as you're driving. But um, that's because they often interview, like uh, Terry Gross's program, where she'll interview an author, and that hooks me, and I'll want to read that book. And I do sometimes look at bestseller lists, and then I also can delete by knowing I'm not reading any books by that person. But uh, if I see two or three reviews that I that seem to say this is a really good book, you should read it. And I go by word of mouth. You know, I'll say Denise, uh, yeah. what have you read? Or Anne, I'm writing down their titles today. <laughs> uh, I, I trust some people's judgment about books, and oh. I will take their word. On that note, I bring the problem conclusion. Oh. Anne, I'm sorry we can't go further into this. I'm sure you use some of the same techniques in, in that process. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've just been uh, so pleased to bring you the last two weeks. Uh, programs uh, last week on fiction, this week on nonfiction, and I'm so proud of my colleagues. And Anne, welcome to this circle of, of reading, and I, I'm just so glad you're part of our faculty at North Idaho College. And we've been so thrilled today to bring you, again, I want to repeat the 1500th weekly program again. As someone who's been here from its inception, I find this a very special day and a milestone. And, uh, and I've just had such a good time with uh, my panelists, Janelle, and, uh, and our three colleagues. Uh, it's just such a delight to spend this holiday season looking at uh, books. And thank you again for all your support and what you do uh, for this institution and for our students. Uh, please be with us again next week. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Again, that was so enjoyable. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.